I'm Dimitri, webmaster of thedreamersedge.com and movie critic for askman.com. I'm Kazim, an English editor with Deluxe Digital. And I'm Dennis B. Welcome to part two of A Brief History of Gore. We're going to talk about the horror fiction in the 70s all the way to the 90s this time. Let's get started right away with something I like to call show and tell. So I would recommend Black Christmas, which was directed by Bob Clark. Um, I don't recall the year. 1974. When it comes to horror, I'm not much of a slasher fan. I'm not really into graphic violence, per se. Mm -hmm. But what I like best about horror is creating suspense. That's creating right. that sense of fear. It's the atmosphere. Exactly. It's the atmosphere. It's the it's atmosphere of it. And that's why I like Black Christmas. What's really interesting and unique about Black Christmas is the fact that the killer is always in the, in the same house yeah. with everyone. He's there and he calls them from within. He lets them know that he is there. So then he, he calls them and he goes like, yeah. what's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> <laughs> what's also scary about the killer is that you never really see his face. You only see his eye and usually his point of view mm -hmm. when he's proceeding to kill. Oh yeah, you're really big into that. Eh? I'm yeah, very big on that. point of view. The yeah. unknown, you know, uh, he could be anyone or, you know, he's... Well, it becomes voyeuristic then for you as the honest because now you're in. You're in. And you're just as exploitative in that sense. But what's really scary also is the way um, that he talks to them. You could see that there's something wrong with him. He had a really rough childhood or it's alluded to and uh, it's very creepy. Well, actually, what was interesting... For Black Christmas at the time is the language they used. It was actually quite shocking for audiences oh, because yes. they didn't, they had never heard certain words that they used. That is correct. That that is correct. Is to, That's Canadian filmmaking. Yeah, right exactly. There, though, uh, to, we always pushed the limits of language earlier. Exactly. So it's the language he uses, I think, more than anything that really gets the girls of the sorority kind of worked up because it's verbally abusive and just so disturbing. Uh, and I think that really heightens the terror oh definitely of the film. definitely yeah. and um what also heightens the terror of this uh, movie also is that it does go on the on the principle of less is more you know mm -hmm. there's not too many killings or, or also the killings are very original i find mm -hmm. but it's kind of like um same thing like like halloween yeah it, it works more on the atmosphere and uh really although historically i don't know how accurate a statement that is in fairness because for their time, they were far more explicit than movies were. Oh, yes. They were really movies that, at the time that they came out, were critically panned because they were considered to be more is more. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, oh, and I, I just want to add like, a little trivia thing, uh, just so you guys know. Did you know that uh, this was Elvis's favorite a holiday uh, Christmas movie. Really? He'd watch this with his family. What a macabre yeah. movie. That is bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and... Elvis loved the uh, Black Christmas. Um, I'm actually not a big fan of it. I it, look if you're looking for film history, this this is seminal work in the slasher territory, and all the things you say these are present. I just don't get into it. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Um, so as we mentioned, we're going to talk about the slashers where we left off last time. We left off with exploitation films, which started with Night of the Living Dead in 1968 and went on to the 70s. We're going to wind back a little bit now you mentioned black christmas uh, and uh, and we did talk about it being seminal work and it is officially it's considered the first slasher mm -hmm. personally though i give the credit to psycho psycho yes. would be considered yeah. the grandfather of, yeah. Uh, yeah. if you will it's uh, 1960 so mm -hmm. 14 years before that it's technically a thriller, but it really introduces all the tropes of the slasher, in my opinion. The deranged killer, the succession of victims, the point of view shot that you mm -hmm. mentioned for Black, and Black Christmas, yeah. and the secluded area, which yeah. is also part of the slasher genre. Mm -hmm. And I think the only reason why it's not considered a slasher is because super serious cinephiles like to say, well, no, that's a thriller, that's not close to the trash of the slasher. Even though it has all the qualities of the slash. Yes, <laughs> definitely. The thing is, uh, Psycho is definitely, I would say, like the originator. However, uh, Black Christmas was the one that kind of started the slasher genre in the sense of, uh, if you even think about it, you see, uh, like Black Christmas, then there's Halloween, and then there's Friday the Thirteenth. It started taking the concept of. Mm -hmm. of Black Christmas, like the, even like the holiday or what have you. Mm -hmm. But definitely you're right. Psycho is the one that started it all. I mean, uh, who could forget the uh, infamous uh, shower uh, yeah, scene, which is <laughs> scene with Janet Leigh, you know? It's definitely the, the scene that 
started at all. Yes. Perhaps part of the problem is with uh, people not classifying Psycho as a slasher, is that they think it's more about psychology. It's not, gonna... though. I know, which I yeah. find is strange, and yet that's always the impression I've always gotten from people, is that they feel like they're getting some form of insight Although you're not really, <laughs> yeah. you're not getting anything. You're not. It's, yeah. it's basically he's deranged. That's, That's right. Really, yeah. what it is. Well, they even got the illness wrong. They said yeah. he's uh, schizophrenic, but he has a split personality. That's not the same. Yeah, That's exactly. Right. That's completely different. As much as I love Psycho, I can't stand its ending. Uh, oh. When there's a character who explains what schizophrenia is for what seems like 20 minutes straight. <laughs> yeah. That does kind of ruin it. Yeah. It does, yeah. It, it would, gets it wrong. Yeah. It would have been <laughs> fine if they had left that out, actually. It's a scene built for the slow kids in the class, and I hate that in movies. It's always yeah. very insulting. Kind yes, of I find. Yeah. It's well, always... it, kind of, it takes away from the tempo that had been established throughout the film. That's right. But bringing it back to the slashers as a genre, I will mm -hmm. grant Black Christmas one thing. The age of the, the victim. The dead teenager genre, if you will. Yes, yes, yes exactly. for sure. Yeah. The difference, I think, is that you feel a little bit more the exploitation cinema roots mm -hmm. in, in Black yeah. Christmas, which I think is a large part of slashers. Mm -hmm. Just uh, based on the timeline and the way, you know... Yeah, the fact the that ways, there's such a large yeah. gap between Psycho yeah. and... Then there's nothing after that. It was just uh, it's that's why maybe if Psycho kind of started at all, if you will, uh, maybe Black Christmas was the one that really like perhaps it's because opened the path. Like, Hitchcock followed up with the birds. Yeah, yeah, but you can make a movie and change your career direction, and your movie still go its own path. But, True, mm. except no one seemed interested. Kind of like Black Christmas, course. right? I mean, if the guy did, if uh, you know, they made other movies. Yeah, he did comedies after. That's it. So, um, but again, I, I disagree with the idea of. Black Christmas pioneering the genre. Well, first of all, critically it was panned. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, in terms of revenue and popularity, it's more of a cult classic. I think you hit it more on the mark with Halloween. Well, the thing is this, though, is that Halloween would have almost never have been made if it wasn't for Black Christmas, because even Carpenter, I think, had spoken to the director of uh, Black Christmas. And he even asked him, like, was if you would make a sequel or what have you, this, what would you do? And he said something like Halloween. And, this is where Carpenter kind of took the idea. So without the creation of Black Christmas, there wouldn't be Halloween. But definitely, obviously, it is Halloween that uh, really opened the doors. Is the one that you know every other movie then followed. You know, followed in the footsteps of Halloween. Mm -hmm. It was also um, up until uh, what was it, uh, the Blair Witch Project? I think where it was the most successful independent movie. I think what made Halloween more. Uh, appealing though is that unlike Black Christmas it introduced a monster definitely mm -hmm. and that's the big difference I think people love monsters mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it harks back to the universal monsters in a way I think the 70s and 80s had their own uh, universal monsters even though they were not universal but that's I'm right. talking about Jason uh, Freddy Leatherface Pinhead you know mm -hmm. Michael Myers mm -hmm. Michael Myers of yeah. course and I think that's what Halloween brought that really sparked with the audience. Yeah. Definitely. Because again, you have those masks or horribly disfigured. Yes. And that is very much like the Universal films of the 1930s and 40s. The fact that you can't really see beneath, and even if you get a chance, as you do with Jason, mm -hmm. the, the revelation is supposed to be so horrific that you, you can't even imagine that this person could possibly be human. That's mm -hmm. right. It does go back to, to that because a lot of these... Um, Monsters are people that are uh, isolated, that are, are not accepted mm -hmm. by society, that there's something different or wrong with them or yeah. what have you. So it definitely uh, goes back to its roots. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, but the thing with the, the slashers, it eventually evolved into something else, uh, fantastic horror films in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Nightmare on Elm Street can be largely accredited to that slow shift doing a slasher or a dead teenager movie, as Roger Ebert would call it, mm -hmm. and introducing elements of the paranormal to it. Mm -hmm. oh, that's right. If you were a horror fan, the 80s were great. I'm talking about John Landis, um, an American werewolf in London. John Carpenter, of course, of Halloween fame, and uh, he did quite a few movies in the, in the 80s. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, Stuart Gordon, reanimator and um, from beyond. And of course, John Cassarelli, the Phantasm series. I mean, yeah. out of these, 
directors, is there anyone that stands out as your personal favorite or anything like that? Definitely for me would be obviously uh, John Carpenter, being a huge Halloween fan. Uh, What other than Halloween do you like from him? Well, definitely The Thing. I really liked his take on it. Uh, I do like some of his uh, other works, but they're not horror related. Definitely, uh, that he's, he would be my favorite director per se uh, for the ninth, like eighties and nineties. Uh, mm-hmm. Kazan, I have to be honest. I can't say if I have a favorite amongst people. I like John Carpenter mm-hmm. because I do like Halloween. Um, I like David Cronenberg, who I know doesn't necessarily fall into horror. Maybe not. No, he does. I think he's one of those eighties yeah. masters. So of I, you know, things like. Dead Ringers. Um, you know what I really liked about Cronenberg? Um, gosh, the name is escaping me. For you, for those of you who are not familiar, Cronenberg is this Canadian director who uh, really did a number of really excellent horror films in the 70s. I'm thinking of Rabbit. Oh, yeah. And uh, the one, what's the one where I got the shake? Shivers. Yes, Shivers. Shivers. Yeah. That's why I like Cronenberg. Yeah. I like how he deals with body horror. The idea that you're being infected by something. That's what I like about Cronenberg. That's something that's always uh, been fascinating for me. The idea of disease, of being affected. Most of uh, Cronenberg's early horror cinema, when he went into fantasy, can best be described as repression symbolized by vaginas everywhere. <laughs> that's true. <Okay. laughs> Interesting. He's seeking yeah. to re-enter the womb. I'm... <laughs> uh, I see. <laughs> the ultimate place of creation. Um, yeah, that's what I like about him. I mean, yes, sexuality has always been a very strong part of horror. Definitely, but yeah. I like how he deals with it. Um, while you were eating, you made a reference that uh, one of the things you dislike about slashes is that they were essentially raped with a sharp object. Yeah, that's always a problem I've had because it's always young women, vulnerable, they can't defend themselves, and they're basically carved up by these men who take their time, usually. Mm-hmm. And I... I always found that incredibly disturbing, mm-hmm. you know, because they're always found in they're always in states of undress or they're nude, and that to me has always been very problematic. Which is why I always tend to stay slightly away from the slasher. Mm-hmm. But with Cronenberg, it was a little different for me. I actually appreciated what he was doing or trying to do. When he addresses violence and sexuality, he doesn't try to pass it off as entertainment. He tries to pass it off as something disturbing and haunting. Yes. There's something more honest about the way he addresses that, and as a result, less exploitive. Yes, exactly, exactly. Which, in a way, makes some of his films a very good commentary on what's taking place in terms of the treatment of women. You know, they're generally sexualized. There's something that people obsess over. They feel they have some sort of proprietary rights over. And it's often very hard for these women to become empowered in these sort of films because they're always pictured at the mercy of this man, right? And that's was always bothersome for me. But what's interesting, know. though, is that uh, that's usually the rule, but there are some movies uh, that did come out, let's say, like the first Friday the 13th, where the killer actually happened to be a woman. It, it is, it is There um, are reversals. There are reversals, which are incredibly interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you did mention also that uh, maybe uh, the women do get help from a man, maybe in defeating yeah, the monster. That's another problem, is that they're not proactive in any way in terms of their survival. It's dependent either upon f- fate, or a male character kind of steps in and he does some defensive maneuvers. He's not strong enough to maybe actually defeat mm-hmm. the killer, but he's kind of there to act as a buffer. Interestingly yeah. enough... You're you're absolutely right. Uh, that that's the general, I guess, formula, if you will, of the of, of the slashers in that genre. But uh, I guess that's what makes Friday the Thirteenth so unique. Again, spoiler alert for people who haven't seen the, the movie, where in the ending, let's say the killer is a, a female, but another female kills her, and it's literally a one-on-one battle with no help mm-hmm. whatsoever from any male. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's what makes I think the movie so uh, powerful and. Uh, Original. I, I, I don't know that I'd call Friday the 13th powerful. Uh, <laughs> but you're right that it does break the norm. Yeah. It breaks the it, norm. Yeah. That's that what is, is actually a very good example yeah. of yeah. breaking the norm. Uh, in terms of feminism, since mm-hmm. you brought it up, in the 80s there were two schools of thought uh, relating to slashers. One was that it was uh, projecting women as a constant victim and it was exploiting violence against women as a release. You know, mm. And the other... School of Thought says, 
all of that is true. But at the same time, you have to admit that it plays female as the main protagonist in the movie. It wasn't strong women yet, but it did help uh, usher in that new concept of having women not be morons. <laughs> <laughs> and I just rely on the man uh, to always uh, exactly. get them out of things. Because if you look at Hitchcock's early work, uh, well, Hitchcock's work, period, mm -hmm. the women and the birds are insufferable. All they do is whine, and shriek, shriek, and yeah. shriek. <laughs> yeah, it's, you just want to beat them. Which I guess I can see why <laughs> you get that slasher movement. <laughs> it's like, good lord. Um, but that leads us to why my favorite master of horror is Wes Craven, because Wes Craven actually always has very strong female protagonists. Mm -hmm. They always put up one hell of a fight, and that's one of the things I really love about Wes Craven's movies. Uh, the other thing I like about him, uh, moving away from that, is the issue of uh, Fable. If you look at Nightmare on Elm Street, it's not just a cautionary tale of like, don't go in the woods or somebody will rape you mm -hmm. with a blade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Nightmare on Elm Street is about facing your problems. Everybody who denies what's going on and pretends what they did did happen, crooks. Mm -hmm. Because they're living life asleep instead of facing their problem awake. Mm -hmm. And they touch upon it, alcoholism and all that. So it's all, all his stories tend to be cautionary tales about how to live life better. And I think that's what makes, for me, the, the horror films of that period special. They were, they're the closest you have to modern-day fairy tales and fables. I think that's a beautiful point. Beautiful, right yeah. yeah. I think we don't give enough it's credit. It's redemptive for... Yeah. The genre. I think we don't give it enough credit uh, to, to horror films as, uh, you know... Well, I think people forget about it. Or they forget might, about it. They'll take yeah. elements from it, but they don't tend to credit it. Because, I mean, the one thing about the horror genre, more than any other, it's always been inventive and generally ahead of other genres. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes, well, that's what's going on in America. In the meantime, the Italian films also had a renaissance in terms of horror. And what's really interesting about the Italian horror, unlike American movies, they never got out of the Gothic influence. They stayed Gothic and they stayed Impressionist. Oh. <laughs> um, the large shadows, the wide color, red, green, and blue, that look like sets. You know it's not the real world, but it's scary because you don't know what's on the other corner because the world changes from scene to scene. The stories are always a little bit surrealist. They're kind of like nightmares. Um, if you're the kind of person who watches a movie for plot, um, no, these movies are not the greatest movies for plot. They barely make sense. But they have high emotions. They're disorienting. Yeah, yeah. I think that works well, as you were saying, with the colors that they're using. It's creating a lurid sort of uh, landscape in which, that, in which this takes place. So yeah. I'm not surprised you're nauseous. <laughs> uh, directors to, uh, to look for Lombardo Bava, who did uh, Demons 1 and Demons 2. Uh, if you're not afraid of gore, these movies are terrific entertainment. They're about the media attacking you. The first one is actually really, really clever. What it is, is people go to a theater to see a horror film. And what happens in the film starts influencing what's happening in the theater. Can you imagine how much fun it must have been to sit in a dark theater, watching people in a dark theater being in danger? Yeah. <laughs> from the movie they're watching. <laughs> and it's a sort of wild concept that you could only find in Italian movies at that time. And if you're going to check out any director of that job, there's one name you have to remember, and that's Dario Argento. Okay. He, will, at the time, was called the Italian Hitchcock. Mm. Really? Uh, movies to look for, uh, Suspiria, Inferno, Opera, and my personal favorite, Phenomena. It wasn't as successful as the others, but I, I have tremendous affection for it. Okay, admittedly, because it stars a young Jennifer Connelly, and there's nothing more <laughs> than a young Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> Just to interrupt you real quick before yeah. you go into Phenomena, is there any of these uh, slasher? Suspiria is a slasher. Suspiria. It's an impressionist slasher. So if you're a fan of slashers... Suspiria, yeah. And you can follow it up with Inferno, which uh, Inferno. is uh, technically the sequel to Suspiria. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. All right. Inferno is actually, it's one narrative that actually gathers several narratives. You can watch it as a series of short horror stories that all gather into a single narrative. Oh, so it's like end. a portmanteau, where yeah. you basically have various stories that connect together. But uh, yeah. with these uh, Italian um, uh, horror movies, do they also have um, very particular or interesting uh, twisted... Um, 
endings compared to some of the the horror movies from the uh, 70s and 80s, which were kind of unique, I would say, because there were some movies that had very particular endings, such as, let's say, the original Sleepaway Camp, right? American horror at the time created a reality you can believe in. Teenagers that talked like real teenagers. Yeah. And then presented them with an out-of-this-world evil that they had to fight, you know, whether it be a serial killer or not. Not literally out-of-this-world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> horror films in America will have that escalation. The more you advance mm-hmm. in the movie, the more grotesque it becomes because it Definitely. punches you more. It, like The evil takes over the reality more and more. Mm-hmm. Italian horror films had a different approach of from the beginning creating a universe that is filled with that sense of dread. Inferno does that really well, where people talk like they would in a dream, not in the real world. Ah, and interesting. That, yeah. Definitely. I'll definitely take a look at that. Um, and it's a good time to do it now, because we're now getting these movies released in their original format. Uh, and back in the 80s, when they were important here, they tended to be chopped off by American producers who felt that it lacked cohesion, which... It's actually the charm of those movies, but <laughs> uh, and, and just rearranged them and cut scenes that like uh, phenomena. Perhaps some of our older listeners are more familiar with it under its American title, uh, Creepers, uh, which was sh- cut down a lot for the story to sort of make sense, and it loses all of its magic when they did that. Um, yeah, it was just American arrogance, to be perfectly honest. You have, here you have a man who's called the Italian Hitchcock, and you go like, I like your movie. Let me re-edit it so that it's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's American good. <laughs> <laughs> and Not even. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't even that. Yeah. You know, 80s yeah. and 90s, horror cinema. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of great stuff, but you gotta wade through a lot of crap. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, sequel after sequel after sequel. Yes, definitely. definitely. That's what I think horror films were basically the first to come up with this idea of multiple sequels, isn't it? Oh, I've, horror only as a genre, yes. Yeah, but I'm thinking even further back into the oh. 30s. Well, the Hammer were huge on sequels. Exactly. It seems like this idea of serialization is very key, usually for financial reasons, which is sometimes unfortunate. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah, I mean, by, what is it, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, we were subjected to the Freddy rap. Yeah. And uh, Curse of Michael Myers, which is a six Halloween. Oh boy, yeah. That was a mess. Michael Myers raping his own niece to give birth to Satan's child or something like that? Something like that. Yeah. It hit some lows. <laughs> some very, yeah, it's, it's people uh, that took a great story and just, you know. <laughs> well, they milked it until there was nothing left. That's yeah, what it is. That's yeah. really it. And the thing is, with horror, there's always this audience that you can always draw back in. Because even if they didn't like this particular sequel, they will come to see the next one just to see if things have changed and they're like, okay, we've got a better story going on here now. (laughs) But they're fairly loyal. So in a way, it works for the studios who are doing this to do the sequels over and over again, even if at some point fans are like, oh God, (laughs) you've done this ad nauseum now, I'm sick of this, (laughs) you know, I hate you, (laughs) but I'll still come (laughs) and see number 12. (laughs) Yeah, so... That's part of the reason why there's so much crap. And the other reason, actually, for me, is kind of exciting. Because we have the rise of video back mm-hmm. then. Uh, VCR had kind of exhausted their catalog of old films, uh, VHS movies. I said VCR, but I meant VHS. Mm-hmm. Beta lost. <laughs> and VCR. <laughs> um, and so, well, they had to find new products to put on VHS to have people keep buying, you know? Yeah, of course. And so they started opening houses for direct-to-video uh, productions. And of course, who were the first to get into the action? The <laughs> horror and fantasy film. For yes, sure. That's true. They always recognize an opportunity when it comes along. Do you have any recommendations uh, from some of these? Uh... Yeah, Full Moon was the studio that had... Full Moon? Full Moon, yeah. Really? That had the most fun creations because they really treated it like a comic book. They had crossovers between their monsters. You know, they had part five, six, seven, eight of the same series. And they, the story actually progressed from then to on. It wasn't just like new teenagers meet the same monster. Yeah. So it is serialization. Yeah, but keep in mind, you know, you, 
they're not great movies. Well, you're there to have fun. It's yeah. really what it is. Yeah. And Enjoy the story. Don't question it too much. Because <laughs> <laughs> then you'll go insane. Yeah. I really enjoy the first Puppet Master. It has psychics and killer puppets <laughs> uh, in the same movie. <laughs> Like, it's a movie where you do wonder why people don't bother calling the cops ever. <laughs> <laughs> but what's kind of funny is that it's a mix of stop motion, but especially good old classic puppeteering. Mm. There's something magical about practical special effects and these old arts. It, this is really a showcase of what puppeteering can do in a different context. It's no longer to amuse children. Um, and they eventually fought the Demonic Toys, which was another Full Moon <laughs> franchise. Uh, I don't recommend that. <laughs> yeah. uh, they had Doll Man as well, uh, subspecies, and actually movies that don't involve miniature creatures. <laughs> <laughs> Also, there's, uh, some of my favorite direct-to-video movies come from movies that weren't direct-to-video to begin with. I think Hellraiser stands out for being, I think, the first series that did that. Like Hellraiser 1, 2, right. 3, 4 in theaters, and then all the other ones were direct-to-video. Right. Most of which are better than Hellraiser 3 and 4. <laughs> <laughs> uh, such a series is The Prophecy. The sequels are terrific entertainment. Prophecy 4 is my favorite. And the, the series Prophecy is about angels rebelling against God because they're just tired of being the second favorite. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. yes. Because man, is, is, man is first. Yeah. And the first three movies are about uh, the angel Gabriel played by Christopher Walken. The third movie really finished the story of Gabriel. So the fourth one, we're kind of stuck of having to start something else. And what they did is, what is the devil's perspective from that point? Because mm. the idea in the prophecy is, well, if God loves us so much, why is he so constantly absent? And mm -hmm. Right. You know? And what the Prophecy 4 did is kind of take it from the devil's perspective where, well, if good is so absent in the world and evil is so present in the world, and that makes you question the presence of God, doesn't that also make you question the devil in terms of, well, if he hates us so much, why does he bother so much with us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what Prophecy 4 deals with and has a really romantic answer for it. It's actually a really charming movie. Five characters uh, filmed in Romania. Mm. Really? It exemplifies what I like about direct video movies. They're about ideas. Because mm -hmm. they can't give you thrills with special effects. They can't give you great right. acting. Yes. So to be entertaining, they have to pile on the ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about them. Um, so where are we moving on to now that we've uh, touched on... I think we're actually moving on to the Electric Bigaloo Factory. Ah. Do, 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 do. Electric Bigaloo. Now, trying to pick a movie for the Electric Boogaloo Factory for this period of horror is nearly impossible because every movie has had a stupid sequel already. <laughs> so I want to talk about Lamberto Bava's Demoni, uh, Demons story, which is, as I've explained earlier, evil from the media. Mm. And I want to talk about what we would do for a Demons 3 because Lamberto Bava always talked about making a Demons 3. He wanted it to be in a church. But I think it doesn't really fit with the media story, so I want to talk to you about that. So in 2009, a demons movie about evil in the media, well, it has to be the internet. Yeah, for sure. it's got to be. Now, one of the fun things about the demons movies is that they always start with a false start. Like, the teaser is always something ominous and then it turns out to be nothing at all. So I want a false beginning in Demons 3 as well. It would be uh, an article that claims that Batman is gay, <laughs> and then the person reading it turns livid and violent and monstrous and then it turns out it's just an angry fanboy <laughs> okay cool cool and then we get into the real story which would be about a podcast about people discovering demons like it could be like just three people talking in a room right yeah. and discussing i don't know horror movies for example <laughs> and then one of them would grab a mask like the one i'm holding right now and ow, ow. Hmm, i just cut myself oh anyway yeah. so and then ah oh, what's that Anyway, and uh, yeah, what's uh, going on? Uh, are you okay, man? Yeah, yeah I just, you don't I look just, too good. I just lost a tooth. I don't know what that. Uh... Anyway, so Very you strange. know they would. Uh, so... uh, oh my god! <laughs> 